Uh, why don't we peer into the, pr the present as well as the, the future? We talked a lot about AI, and it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Tommaso Mansi from uh, Siemens Health Engineers and Innovation Center, and he will share with us uh, what they're doing in artificial intelligence. Tommaso, it's great to have you here. So thank you very much, Dr. Zogby. It's a great honor and pleasure to be here to present you what we do and in, in the field of artificial intelligence. I'm going to try to introduce a bit the concepts of artificial intelligence, what it is exactly, what, how it works, some examples of what we can do today, what we are working on, hoping that we will be able to do tomorrow. And I'm not sure if this is the future, but at least this is something we are working on and maybe will be part of the future. So, just to start, um, so innovation has been our core driver for many, many years in Siemens, and imaging have improved tremendously since the very beginning of the CT scans, MRI, echo, and, and just to give a couple of examples, this is what we can see on a living body from a CT scan using latest rendering technologies. Um, for instance, this is an image that won the best radiology image competition in the Out Minis last year, <clears throat> and where you could see, for instance, nicely the coronary artery fistulae that connects then to the pulmonary artery. So basically, we can get now more and more details from the images. And this is CT, but not only right on ultrasound, for instance. This could be a new way of looking at ultrasound using this new rendering technology. So this is, this is an ultrasound image, right? that was acquired. And, and this is a case from Piedmont, from Dr. Van Aan, where we also got the surgical view of that same case. So now you can see that with the new imaging model, with the new transducers and the new rendering techniques, we can start seeing things like if they were wide open in front of us. So you see that this very nice P2 prolapse, prolapse here from an ultrasound. But then you get all these images, and all these images become larger and larger with more and more details, and it becomes more and more complex to understand and, and really identify what's going on in these images, and it's where artificial intelligence could potentially help. So just to put a bit of context, artificial intelligence has been around for many years, right? Actually, the first term of artificial intelligence started in the 1950s, and it went through waves, all along. So you have different types of artificial intelligence. So the first type where you have an engineer with a very strong no domain knowledge who implements basically rules and say, if you see this and you find this and you see that, then this is what needs to be done. Basically, these are called expert systems and they have been existing for many years. But then there is another concept called machine learning. So how does machine learning work? Machine learning, basically, you give to the computer a set of, if we go into the imaging, a set of images, and then a set of annotations provided by experts. So for instance, if I, uh, I will show some examples, but if you look at the segmentation of a valve from a, from a TE image, for instance, you can have thousands of TE images then with the mitral valve, and then you use ma uh, statistical learning and machine learning techniques to teach the computer to identify where the valve is and also to do the, the contouring and the sizing appropriately. Then came neural network, which are speci a specialized set of machine learning. And if your neural network is really big, then you get what we call deep learning, which is basically the trend of today. And why do we call neural network? This was inspired by how our neurons are connected to each other. So you have layers of neurons the data comes in and then gets processed by each of these neurons that are connected to each other. And then in the end, you get basically the outcome of the processing that can be recognizing a face or rec recognizing a dog uh, against a cat or for what is our, or for discussion today, recognizing the left and right ventricles, the valve, and so on and so forth, or a disease, and so on and so forth. So this is deep le machine learning, AI, deep learning, and AI is taking a is taking, um, is growing very, very fast lately, thanks to the advance of deep learning, but most importantly, because of big data. Big data and computational power. 
What happens was this. In this slide, what you see, so traditional machine learning has been in the field for many years. Actually, you might be using tools already that features AI without even knowing it. With using traditional machine learning, as you throw more and more annotated data sets, as more and more examples, you reach a plateau of performance. Let's say you cannot be, you, you, do, you have an error rate of, let's say, 10%. With deep learning, basically, these techniques actually break this performance. They are able to get the most of the data. So th for these techniques, if you get 10,000, 100,000, 1 million data sets, they are able to capture all the information in this data in order to, make, to do the task that we train them for. And this is why now AI is impacting almost everything. Because now we are able to leverage the vast amount of data sets that are generated every day. From a medical perspective, where AI will, take a, will have a role, right? And from our experience and what we see is that actually AI can impact all the steps of clinical practice. The very first thing is on the scanner, right? So you can help automating workflows. I will show you some examples. But also AI can help improve the reconstruction of images, for instance, on MR. Then, Given an image, AI can do the segment, can, could potentially do the segmentation, the contouring measurement, detect diseases, help identify um, uh, features that would help for the diagnosis and also the guidance. And then once you start getting more and more robust systems that you can trust, then you can go at one level up at the patient level where you would use these technologies to predict, plan, or prescribe what would be the best for a certain patient, help the decision support, or also build a digital twin of the patient that would, be, that would integrate all this information in one virtual representation of what the patient is. And then finally, of course, because now you can process reliably all the patients of a region of the hospital, you can start doing uh, a population analysis, look at the outcome at a larger scale, and so on and so forth. So we see really artificial intelligence and big data impacting all these levels. Of course, as you go up to the scales, things become more and more complex because you have more and more data sets that you need to put together and so on. However, the trend exists. And as I said, even though you read AI in the news a lot and AI can impact this, AI can beat uh, the human in AlphaGo and so on and so forth, this is something that exists today and that you might be using already. So actually, we have quite several products that are AI-powered that you are already using. The first one, for instance, is, uh, is Evolves. And here, for instance, we trained a model to detect, track, and quantify the aortic and mitral valve from TE images. And we did that by basically leveraging a database of TE images and their annotations. And then the model and the, 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 the computer learned how to detect and then track these structures. And the nice thing is that once you have the model in place, you have a list of measurements that you can use for diagnosis, therapy planning, device sizing, and so on and so forth. Another cool thing is um, combining 3D cameras with traditional scanners to improve the workflow. How does that work? So this is something that we showed at our SNA. So you have a 3D camera on top of a CT scanner. So a 3D camera is just a standard camera with depth. So for those who know Kinect and used to play with it, so it's this kind of cameras. And using this camera, basically, and computer vision technologies, you can basically fit an avatar of the patient. And from that avatar, then know if the patient is in the right position, know the physiology of the patient more correctly, and then do isocentering faster with a better dose modulation. And also what is cool is that you could say then just, okay, scan me the lung, or scan me the heart, or scan me the liver to the scanner. And then automatically, because the patient, we know the patient, we know how he is, how he's positioned, then the scanner knows exactly how to move the table and then do the scan appropriately. And just to give you an example, so this is on the research side, so it also works on the, for x-rays here. What you see, so it's a volunteer sitting on the table. So there is no x-ray, we don't image, it's a volunteer. But you see on top here, 
the avatar that has been automatically fit to the patient, and then from the model, basically, we can then say, okay, do an X-ray of the head, and then automatically, the arm goes to the head, go to the shoulder, or then to the, to the thorax. So basically, you see how AI, cameras, computer vision can also simplify workflows. And then it goes also on the guidance. So this is through fusion. Um, Dr. Lang this morning showed how we could fuse ultrasound with x-rays to basically guide such your heart interventions, for instance. And here, where is AI, right? So you want to put the two things together. So basically, we use machine learning and neural networks to automatically detect on the x-ray image here the probe, the TEE probe. And once you know where the probe is in the 3D space, then basically you have everything together, so now you can bring the ultrasound information on the X-ray in a, in a reliable way. And now thanks to AI, you can do this in real time, so you can basically update all the images and all the information on the X-ray to guide the intervention. And just to give you an example, a kind of a zoomed in example, so this is basically combining easy valves, the automatic detection and modeling of the mitral valve, fused then on the X-ray and all this in the OR, in the CAT lab. So now, artificial intelligence comes if you have a large amount of data sets. So we started to, to um, we have a data lake with um, 250 million images that we can use to train these agents. But of course, you also need infrastructure. So basically, we have a supercomputing with I think we are at 32 teraflop, uh, petaflops. I mean, it's very high compute power because you need basically a lot of computational power to train these artificial agents to perform the, the, the job. And I will explain you how. Let's go a little bit more in the techniques, right? So all this might sound magic. So how does that work exactly? So in a traditional machine learning approach, if you want to know where an anatomical landmark is in the image, let's take the, the apex of the heart. What you usually do from, a computer, from a, a computer scientist's point of view, right, is that you go pixel by pixel, right? And then you associate to each of these pixels a probability if that pixel is the apex. And you learn this probability using machine learning, so basically use, by providing these annotations and these images. Now, it's kind of computer intensive, right? So because you have to go all the, you have to scan all the pixels and then assign this probability and then the winner is the point that you are looking for. You as a human or we as humans, right? We don't do that. If you want to look at the app, if you want to find the apex of the, of the heart, you just scan the image and you get it super fast, right? You don't go pixel by pixel. So basically we develop this technology of artificial intelligence where we actually try to mimic the human behavior. So what we did is the following. So we gamified the problem of finding a landmark. So we said, let me land an artificial agent anywhere in the image, and then the agent ha could, can go up, up, down, left, right, in front, on the back, right, move like this, take a set of decisions until it finds the apex. At each of the actions of the agent, we say, good boy, bad boy. So actually, for finding the apex, we just tell him that it's good boy or bad boy when the agent goes, stops, and, and says that he has found the apex. That's it. It's the only thing. And then basically, by having the agent doing it again and again and again, and then saying good boy, bad boy, good boy, bad boy, and using concepts like we call reinforcement learning, basically, the AI learned what is the best strategy to parse the image and find that point. And by doing so, actually now, you don't go pixel by pixel anymore. The AI learns to find basically the shortest path by looking what is around. So, oh, I am at the lung, maybe I should go down, and then navigating directly to the point of interest. So there are two things that are cool with that. So the first thing is that now you can parse a full, C a full body CT scan in milliseconds and have all the, all the anatomical landmarks of interest very fast. So you can think of integrating this into workflows that could parse your image directly, provide you measurement at, at a fingerprint. But then what is also cool is that now we have a way to, tell, to train agents to tell us when an organ is not there. Meaning that if we are looking at the head neck, 
and we say, okay, where is the heart? We will not get a random point somewhere because its probability was higher than the other ones, but the heart was there. The agent will just tell us, I could not find the heart. And this is very powerful because once you know more or less what are the organs in your image, then you can zoom in, and then you can train other AIs to perform, for instance, the contouring. So here I show the liver, but it applies the same for cardiology. And here how we do it is that actually we further leverage the power of competition. So we know now where the liver is in an image. So then we train two artificial intelligence. The first one is job is to basically contour the liver, right? So it gets the CT scan and then provides you the contour. We do that by basically providing examples, CT scan contour, CT scan contour, and basically we learn the mapping. But then we train another agent whose only goal is to tell if a mask comes from the AI or comes from a human. And then you train them together. So the first one needs to get the best contour as possible, and the other one needs to identify, to be as good as possible to identify which contour was generated by the AI. And by making them compete, basically we reach levels of accuracy and robustness that we could not reach before. So artificial intelligence, the new technologies, basically bring new ways of teaching the computer to perform a certain task. And when you put all this together, then what you get is that this is a, a, a video that is a um, live recording of our prototype. In just six seconds, basically we could identify 25 out of the 54 anatomical landmarks that we asked for. 25 were successfully found. The others is because the organ was not there. So there was also some brain and knee stuff. They were not in the image. And we could also provide, calculate the 3D mask of all the organs available, uh, visible in these images. And then from that, you can think that given that information, you can then calculate volumes, um, you can calculate volumes, diameters, all set of measurements that you could put in a table of measurement and then to help the diagnosis. Back to cardiology. So the same concepts, of course, apply. So here is an example of how you can use artificial intelligence to, to detect, model, and track the four chambers from TTE images, for instance. And then from that, get all the measurements of volumes, strain, um, morphology, curvature, and so on. Another example that is also pretty cool is multimodality. So multimodality is very important to assess, for instance, how the coronaries are with the strain, or if you want to do interventional guidance to overlay some preoperative planning on top of it. How you usually do that, I pass you the mathematical details, but basically what you say is the, you do, I have my image A, my image B, I do A minus B, and then I try to make it A minus B equal to zero. But here we took the similar approach. We looked at how human would do it, right? So, as a human, what you do is you look at the two images, and then you move one image up and down. You rotate it, basically, until you get the mapping that you want. And actually, we can go very fast in doing the alignment, because you have the intuition of where you should go, and then you align. So we train the agent exactly the same way. So we provide examples of pairs of images that can be MR to X-ray or MR to ultrasound. And then we say, good boy, bad boy, at each of the actions of the agent. And by doing this reinforcement concept, basically we trained the artificial agents to perform the registration process. And what was a bit creepy, at least for us, is that without changing anything into the methodology, just by teaching the agent to perform the task on different modalities, the agent learned to do it. So actually we started with the CT dynasty of the spine, and then we said, okay, let's try the heart. We just show example of the heart without changing anything, and then it learned to align the heart. When we said, okay, let's challenge things a bit. Let's put ultrasound with MR or ultrasound with CT, and it learned to perform the alignment. And the same with 2D and 3D registration. And again, the level of performance is much higher, so we get much better robustness than using traditional techniques. And just to continue over examples, so because now things become more and more robust in the terms of detection and tracking, so then you can think of real time tracking of landmarks on ultrasound, or even real-time modeling, for instance, here of the mitral annulus ring. 
And all this real-time information could then be fused with the X-ray imaging, for instance, if you want to guide such your heart interventions. And again, even one more step, once you have the avatar done, then you can think of the augmented reality. So this time, you have the 3D camera, the avatar that is fit, you put all this together with the advanced visualization, then you can zoom inside the heart with a view that is realistic, and finally guide where you should do, for instance, the minimal, the incision for minimally invasive surgeries, and so on. But this is just the beginning, right? So we, 10, 15 years ago, we started all this by looking at one organ, one organ at a time, and then several organs, right? But the trend, and with the data that is being generated today, is really to look at systems and then at the full human body. If you take heart failure, for instance, it's interesting to see the heart, but also the brain, the kidneys, in order to understand the entire system. But then there is a thinking, okay, what else? Right? There has been an excellent discussion this morning regarding physiology. Right? The images is not only what you see, but it's also to try to understand how things work, uh, and, I mean, how the organs are working, right? And then comes the natural question, okay, now if I have a lot of data and if I have these agents that can help me extract all this information for me, what if now I could create this digital twin on the computer of that patient? What if I can bring together the ultrasound, the CT, the electrocardiogram, the lab test, put all this together to have a digital representation of the beating heart, right? I could better describe what's going on. So we discussed about FFR, calculating it non-invasively. So this is one example. Help the diagnosis process, or maybe predict, do what if? What if I put a placemaker here? What if I ablate here? What if I put this valve? And so on and so forth. And then also prescribe. Maybe you might need to put one or two microclips or three for this patient to get a better outcome. So we developed a, basically a um, computational modeling platform that is supported by all the artificial agents that I showed you to help us extract the information and do personalized modeling of the, of the organs of interest that go from anatomy, electrophysiology, biomechanics, circulation, molecular, putting all this together. And just to show you an example of what you could achieve with that, that was a case that, we, that um, we received MRI data, 12 lead electrocardiogram, and the blood pressure. So from the MRI data, we automatically extracted the geometry, the strain, the substrate. From the electrocardiogram, we could estimate the, um, ele uh, the electrical conductivity of the Purkinje system and of the muscle, and then created the beating heart by matching the volume curves and the blood pressure. So then we created this digital twin. And then just for the sake of the exercise, right, this patient didn't get a surgery, but just for the sake of the exercise, we simulated the cardioplegia process. So we injected virtual potassium into the heart. The virtual potassium basically messed up with the ion channels, and the heart stopped. But then we let, him, we let the potassium wash, wash out of the heart, and the heart entered arrhythmias, which happens quite often. You can see the nice rotors and so on, and then virtually defibrillated the heart that came back to normal beating heart. This was just an exercise, but imagine what you could do, right? You could say, okay, what if I place a CRT device? What would be the optimal planning? What if I, I does this patient need an ICD? Yes, no, by combining, for instance, electro um, electrocardiogram with the substrate information, where should I ablate? Many, many questions that can be investigated by such technologies. Just to give you an example, this can apply to the, mitre, to the, to the valves, for instance. This is a study we did a few years ago. So we're basically starting from TE data. We used, the, um, we used machine learning and AI to automatically get us the anatomy and dynamics of the, of the valve. And then on top of that, we estimated the tissue properties by looking at the motion and pressure information. From these tissue properties, basically, we could simulate the baseline, the valve closure in these patients. And then what is interesting is that for one case, actually, and then later on, we also uh, looked at mitral valve repair, is that for that case, we had the chance of having the TEE data after a mitral clip. So basically, what we did, we stitched we virtually mimicked the mitral clip 
to that patient on the model, and then we try to see if the model was able to predict, to tell us how would be the closure on that patient, so we could compare. So this is just to give a glimpse, right, what you could do with such a technology, and we looked also at um, mitral valve repair, when you could do suturing, and also annuloplasty, and all these kind of things. And the last thing was mentioned this morning, right, so still in the physiology, so this is how we can calculate um, intrinsic properties of the blood flow and here FFR in real time by using AI to learn the physiology from the data. So here actually again the video goes faster than me, but basically this is a machine learning based uh, FFR computation from angiograms. This is a real, uh, real time recording of our prototype, so basically what you do is that you click two points of the coronary of interest, machine learning and automatically segments the coronary, identify the stenosis, but then you get a real-time FFR that is calculated using deep learning. And this FFR value actually matches very, very well. Actually, we have a correlation of 0 0.99 with the computational free dynamics value, and then we are doing um, now comparison against invasive FFR to see the val uh, validity of the technology. So now you can think of not sending any data anymore and being able to do non-invasive FFR just at the bedside. To conclude, so where are we going? So basically with these technologies, so with neural networks, with big data and computational power, right, we can extract more from the information that we acquire. We can get more and more little fingerprints of the patient state given the image that you have. And now you can think of, okay, if I have a patient, I got the echo, the CT, maybe the MR, the angiograms, all this clicker data. We pass, through the, we pass this data through these neural networks of measurements and then combine all this into a neural networks that can basically take the most of that data and create kind of a small fingerprint of the patient. And then you can use that information to, for instance, find which patient is a closet from your cohort, what happened to that patient in order to do some similarity thinking, also potentially why not predict cardiac events like sudden cardiac death by basically combining all this information together. Yes, that's pretty much, thank you for your attention. Any questions that you may have? So uh, thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, you were talking about uh, your uh, software version for calculation of FFR. Is this FDA approved? Um, if not, what are your plans and what kind of research supports the data? So I'm on the research side of Siemens. So I don't know exactly regarding the FDA and, and so on approval. I cannot really comment. But we have uh, research prototypes we use to evaluate and to test uh, the algorithms. So uh, happy to discuss more. And we have Fasc it on fascinating and so powerful, really fascinating. So that's the future, guys. And I hate to think of what will be 10 years down the line of what, <laughs> what things can be done. So thank you, Tommaso, again. Thanks thank for you. sharing. We have one part. more question. <laughs> yes, what do you have? Yes, thank you for your, I mean, explicit presentation. Since from what you said is uh, the computer or whatever uh, robots you are, uh, you are using or commanding is the information you feed or you command the machine, what if there is an error from what the text or whoever you have been training or uh, introduces is collate? Remember you said this is, the feedback you get is based on the data you introduce into the system. How do you uh, hope to checkmate or to guide against all those errors? That's my question. Thank you. So, if I, so um, just to rephrase to make sure I got it. So basically your question is that what happens if your, the data we use to train these algorithms, they have errors, right? Yes. So that's a very good question. So that's why we have a very rigorous process of acquiring, curating, and annotating data with quality checks at every, at every stage. And the quality process, of course, is tailored to the specific task at hand. So we have a dedicated team 
that basically their only mission and goal is to provide the highest quality annotation on the data that we acquire. And this team actually is, is um, we have experts and also involved radiologists, cardiologists, or uh, oncologists, depending, of course, of the, of the problem at hand. Okay. Thank you.